Good morning, everybody, and welcome to this East Asian Institute Distinguished Lecture uh, this Thursday morning. Uh, my name is Bert Hoffman. I'm the director of the East Asian Institute, and it's my great pleasure to have uh, Professor Paul Evans here to talk about an intriguing, interesting, historical, but also highly contemporary uh, topic, Fairbanks and the 50s, Lessons in Navigating U.S.-China Confrontation. We also have the great pleasure to have Professor Wang Gungwu here to comment uh, as the first person to comment on the lecture. Professor Paul Evans is the HSBC Chair of Asian Research at the School of Public Policy and Global Affairs at the University of British Columbia in Canada. Paul has a very extensive record of research. He worked at the University of York, the University of Toronto, at Harvard University, and at the University of British Columbia. Uh, but his claim to fame, or his claim to fame for this particular topic, is that he also wrote a fantastic biography of John Fairbank uh, back in 1988. And I'm not sure whether I give a, away a spoiler, but he is working on an update of that, I believe. And I'm sure he'll give that away himself. Professor Wang Gong Wu, uh, for those people in Asia, he hardly needs any introduction. He is the university professor. Uh, at NUS, uh, has a very long and distinguished career uh, in, in Asia, in Australia, in Hong Kong, in Malaysia. And uh, we are very honored and pleased to have him here in e the East Asian Institute and very happy to have him here as commentator on Professor Paul Evans' speech. Paul, without further ado, over to you. Well, thank you. Uh... Uh, very much, Bert, uh, to you and your colleagues at the East Asian Institute for inviting me to speak in this series and for providing such a fine perch during my two-month stay at NUS this time last year. COVID cut things short, including the interviews I'd scheduled in Singapore and the region, but I hope that when circumstances permit, the Institute will have me back again. And I suppose that my welcome will depend on how well I perform today. Uh, my special thanks to Professor Wong for agreeing to comment uh, on the presentation. I regard him as the great China historian of our time and place, as Fairbank was in his time and place a generation ago. <clears throat> my uh, curiosity about um, uh, Professor Wong's perspective on Fairbank is fairly further peaked by his recent book, uh, Home is Where We Are, wonderful account of an academic life on the move with his, with his wife, Margaret, uh, in uh, all kinds of locations and multiple roles. But it has a fascinating chapter in it on his visit to 14 American universities in 1960 including Harvard, where he got a feel not just for the scholarship uh, in the United States of the era, but its fractious political setting. And I'm, I'm sorry we can't be having this discussion in person as originally planned uh, with a live Singaporean audience. Uh, but I'm delighted that we're able to bring in by Zoom an, an intercontinental group of participants including from other parts of Asia, North America, Australia, and New Zealand. We've been finding in this COVID year that communicating and teaching via Zoom is, is like taking a shower with your clothes on. Uh, not bad, but not perfect. But it does allow quite a number to get in the shower stall at the same time. Well, as Bert mentioned, today's presentation is based on a work in progress that has been 43 years in the making. My biography, John Fairbank and the American Understanding of Modern China, was published in 19, 1988. It was based on a decade of archival work with complete access to Fairbank's papers and extensive interviews with the man himself and many of his students, colleagues, and critics. Uh, but the book has not gone to bed. Three years ago, I returned to Fairbank to work on what might be considered a second installment of the biography. 
In part, this was because my book, A Vivisectional Study, came out three years before Fairbanks' death in 1991. Uh, and those three years between 1988 and 1991 were very active ones in his own life. Two new books, one of them his China, A New History, delivered to the Harvard University Press a few hours before his fatal heart attack. They were also turbulent years in the world and in China. The tragic events during and after Tiananmen Square, uh, two years be before his death, demanded something further. Working with his daughters, we located some important new material in the family summer home in Franklin, New Hampshire. And I think that's going to add something important to the story of his latter days and perhaps his long-term legacy. It's unusual to have an opportunity for a second look at a subject's life in very different times and from the vantage point of an observer who himself has lived an active, if rather less spectacular life as a Canadian academic. I don't plan to revise the 1988 book in any significant way, but rather to look at what Fairbank means 30 years after his death. And the compass of this, this new project, Fairbanks Redux, is first Fairbank as a historian. Which of his ideas live on? Uh, treaty ports, tribute system, China's response to the West, Chinese conceptions of world order. Uh, are his books still read? Where have four generations of students taken his ideas, revised them, or, or jettison them, and how to teach Chinese history. Uh, so that's involving conversations with a lot of historians, almost all of whom can trace either a route to the Fairbank tree or can comment on the Fairbank tree from a distance. Uh, and it is also involving interviews and discussions with how Fairbank the historian in China. Who talks about him? What do they say? The second uh, kind of dimension of this uh, new, uh, new phase of the biography is Fairbank as organizer and institution builder. Even if organizational structures at Harvard and elsewhere for studying and connecting to China have proliferated and developed in so many new directions, what elements of Fairbank's vision and ethos are still visible and recognized, especially at Harvard? We admire the buildings designed by Frank Lloyd Wright many years after they were completed. Can the same be said of the academic houses that JKF, uh, John King Fairbank, uh, designed and built? Um, the third part of uh, Fairbank Revisited is his role as interpreter and actor in US China relations. In some ways, that may be natural for a uh, student of international relations like myself. But Fairbank was distinctive because of his constant connection and constant involvement in the wharf and the whoop of official Washington, Beijing interactions, but the societal forces that lay beneath and behind those in the contemporary and behind. So today, uh, the focus is going to be on just basically one decade of Fairbank's life, and that's the 1950s. But let me take a step back. Why Fairbank and why the 1950s? <clears throat> For those who, who are unfamiliar with John Fairbank, the headline sketch would read something like the following. Born in 1907 in the Midwest, not far from the Canadian border, of non-missionary parents with no China connection. Educated mainly at Harvard and Oxford. Professor of Chinese uh, history at Harvard from 1936 to 1977 and an emeritus for 14 years thereafter. About seven years living in China, mainly as a student and then intelligence officer during World War II. Author or editor of something like 27 books and hundreds of articles on China, Chinese history, and US-China relations. He had two smash hits 
the four editions of the United States and China, uh, first published in 1948 uh, and last one in 1979. That was the second largest selling book on China written by an American uh, in, 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 his, in his lifetime. And he, and he co-authored with Edwin Reischauer and later Al Craig, a textbook uh, that was the kind of, well, if not Bible, at least the basic text that uh, almost all of us had is our first book on China and East Asia. Um, Fairbank was an educator and teacher with his students going on to teach at more than a hundred different universities. Uh, he was a leading figure in the design of East Asian studies across the US and uh, especially uh, in the 19, from the 1950s to the 1970s. He was president of both the Association for Asian Studies and the American Historical Association. He was a towering public figure in policy debates uh, <clears throat> with a wide following and several generations of determined critics. Fairbank was the quintessential engaged historian. This was natural to him and many of his World War II generation. As a university-based historian and area specialist, he jumped into the public policy arena with both feet for most of 55 years. Explaining China to Americans across what he frequently noted was a hostile cultural divide came with risks. Those risks came at home with a vengeance in the 1950s when he and many other China specialists in government and the academy were pulled into the teeth of the Cold War and immersed in the great fear of the McCarthy era and anti-communism and the era of containment and isolation of China. The 1950s had a special importance for the China field in the US that is painfully remembered by those who lived through it. But like the Korean War itself, it is sometimes forgotten. When I wrote my book in the mid 1980s, engagement of China was in full swing, in full blossom. Uh, the anti-communist, the contain and isolate China consensus, the attacks on individuals deemed to be too sympathetic or too closely connected to communist China, and bitter scholarly differences were part of an interesting history, but an inert past. It was past. Well, developments in the last five years have made clear that some of the same forces operating in the 1950s are at play in contemporary America and in Sino-American relations. To be sure, there are major differences. China is now a much more formidable global actor, deeply connected to America through universities, economy, people flows, et cetera. China specialists are no longer being hauled before congressional committees to defend themselves against charges of disloyalty. The 1950s were an era of full-scale confrontation with the PRC including during the Korean War, the sanctions and diplomatic isolation that followed. China was not just an adversary, but a full-blown enemy. In the 1950s, developments inside China, including land reform, anti-rightist campaigns, the Great Leap Forward, and, and later the famine that followed, showed the brutality and violence of CCP leadership. And China reasserted control over Tibet and Xinjiang and supported insurrections in uh, several countries in Southeast Asia. So that was then, and, but if the past isn't repeating, it's very easy to hear the rhyme. This is an era characterized by a strong bipartisan consensus in the United States for framing China as an adversary, a rival, a strategic competitor. Uh, a China under a strong central leader now that is repressive at home and assertive abroad. Very little public or media debate, little credible or visible opposition to the view of China as a major threat to the United States and the prevailing international order. 
and real concern that confrontation can lead to outright military conflict. Taiwan, probably the most worrisome point of contention at this point, but there are others as well. Calls for decoupling resonate with an earlier era of sanctions and isolation. Scholars in the US, this time mainly in the STEM areas uh, uh, and uh, uh, biopharmacy areas, and mainly of Chinese descent, are facing criminal charges for improper associations with China. Uh, and academic disagreements about China can spill over into bitter divisions that stretch into matters not just of interpretation and opinion, but of integrity and even loyalty. And I'm sad to say that that is something that is now a new virus in the Canadian context as well. Well, <clears throat> how to read Fairbank in the 1950s. Um, I'm going to revisit him in, in three specific areas about, I think, the inner life uh, of Fairbank as he navigated that turbulent decade of Cold War. Uh, the first part is going to be on the perils and prospects of the engaged scholar. The second is the dilemmas faced by liberal scholars like Fairbank in setting their moral compass in dealing with the dark elements of Chinese thinking and behavior. And the third is how to frame engagement, especially in universities, in a context of public skepticism and geopolitical confrontation. And uh, Bert, I hope in some final remarks, I'll try my hand at what the ghost of Fairbank might convey to the new Biden administration. Well, the perils of the engaged scholar. In all of the phases of his career, Fairbank had one eye on history and another on contemporary events and policy matters. Parenthetically, of course, many of his students remember him as having a third eye focused on their production of those manuscripts he so treasured. But during the 1950s, Fairbank developed a keen appreciation of the risks that policy involvement and public advocacy could pose. He had his own scrapes with the Military Entry Permit Review Board in Washington that refused him a visa to visit Japan. He uh, had a scrape with the McCarran Committee uh, investigating the Institute of Pacific Relations and led to a, a famous two-day hearing in, in, in Capitol Hill. He supported Owen Lattimore and several of the foreign service officers caught up in the who lost China recriminations. He was labeled a communist sympathizer by Time Magazine and a communist apologist by a young congressman from Massachusetts named John Fitzgerald Kennedy. An academic at another university uh, and some of his critical colleagues accused him of being in a pro-China rather than a pro-America camp. His contacts with the State Department were largely severed until the early 1960s. Invitations for national media appearances dwindled. dwindled excuse me. These slings and arrows hurt, and they served as a warning. He advised his students and colleagues to be prepared to defend themselves and begin meticulously collecting all their writings and correspondence in the event that they later may be used against them. Fairbank's professional reputation was secure and expanding, but he was well aware he held views that ran against the grain of popular opinion and official thinking. Sometimes, he calculated, it's best to duck. His strategy is being reproduced in the US and Canada as a number of engagement-oriented academics are ducking, withdrawing from public discussions amidst an avalanche of negativity that challenges their policy preferences, but also their integrity and loyalty. In Canada, the proponents of engagement are whispered to be targets of elite capture by, Be by, 
excuse me, elite capture by Beijing. Fairbank later recalled that the 1950s were a good time to write history, and that he did. Six books in the decade of the 1950s, supervision of 40 doctoral theses, the launch of um, uh, a new administrative operation became East Asia Research, Research Center, uh, and a um, uh, that later morphed into what is now known as the Fairbank Center for Chinese Studies, an institution building even at Harvard and even with outside funding is not without its special challenges. Doubling down on research, writing, teaching, and organizing played another role, reinforcing his view how involvement in public discussion can in fact erode good scholarship. In his 1959 presidential speech, to the Association of Asian Studies, he stated, the Asia specialist becomes more and more important in his American environment as his grasp of Asian life gets thinner and thinner. Having, starting, having started out as a scholar, he may wind up as a Asia expert, busily serving to the American public those answers which are already in the common mind. In a process of give and take, which is touted as democratic discussion or even as policy formation, but which may be no more than collective auto intoxication. This was not just a lament for being on the outside and distance from being able to visit China uh, and uh, Asia in the ways that he had hoped but an identification of different roles that scholars can play as professional academics whose credentials rest on academic accomplishment and recognition by peers, as experts who use academic knowledge to inform public debate and policy formulation, and as pundits speaking on matters outside their area of expertise and addressing them in the mode of mainstream opinion. Through uh, his career, Fairbank played all three roles, scholar, expert, and pundit. But by the 1950s, we're fully aware that they were separate enterprises, each with its own risks and rewards. He had identified the intellectual risks of the expert addressing an audience on its terms and of the pundit being required to press a view, preface views with boilerplate condemnations of the evils of communism, pro-American commitments, before he could get into the key points he wanted to make. He encouraged his students to get their dissertations done before heading into public service or premature public engagement. In a 21st century world of early and ubiquitous encouragement of students to broadcast their views out of the starting gate, there are lessons about punditry, premature and mature, worth considering. The Fairbank lesson for today may well be abandon innocence, all ye who enter here, and don't do it when you're young. Second uh, area that I think was uh, fascinating about Fairbank in the 1950s was the setting of the liberal moral compass. China specialists in the United States and other Western countries face a fundamental dilemma. How to interpret and explain a country and ruling group that many in their own communities do not like, do not trust, and in fact despise. What should they say about the authority of the Chinese Communist Party and its leadership? The legitimacy of the Chinese Communist Party? in Chinese eyes? How should they react to acts of cruelty and brutality uh, by the Chinese uh, regime? How should they convey their views in public settings in the media, whatever their personal uh, and emotional reactions? Fairbank is represented of a particular form of American liberalism. He was a progressive on domestic issues raised by a prairie progressive mother and himself an active member in the 1950s 
of the Americans for Democratic Action, along with his brother-in-law, Arthur Schlesinger Jr. He was, cosmo he was a cosmopolitan internationalist, knowledgeable about the world and active in it. As a co-inventor of the idea of East Asia, a region defined on the basis of being part of the Chinese culture area, the foundation of that famous textbook. Fairbank took civilizations as the basic building block for understanding China. He was skeptical about universals, including concepts like universal human rights. He never predicted convergence or an end of history and saw folly in Western efforts to advance their core values and institutions, whether those be religious or political, across civilizational lines. A clash of civilizations was, was possible, uh, but also avoidable based on deep understanding and the fact that there were overlaps that could provide the foundation for coexistence. Uh, another sign that uh, not all Harvard people who take civilization seriously uh, uh, come to some of the same conclusions. The inner story of the 1950s was the complexity of being what he described as a tolerant and a tolerant relativist at the height of the Cold War, caught between a violent and aggressive China and a hostile and frightened United States. How to understand and explain communist China without apologizing, apologizing or whitewashing its actions and uh, a trajectory so different from core American values. His answer to how to set that moral compass was in part determined uh, through what he called managing his own values. And it had taken root during his wartime posting, mainly in Chongqing. In the 1940s, Fairbank wrote frequently and passionately about the failings of Chiang Kai-shek and the Kuomintang uh, regime in ways that were harsh, angry, and evoked American values as the standard of judgment. A decade later, and for the remainder of his career, he portrayed the brutalities and evils of the Chinese Communist Party in a more nuanced way. He was certainly aware at a granular level of human rights violations, the absence of democracy, the violence of regime actions, and many social practices. Often he winced and occasionally he publicly commented upon them. Uh, but he did so with emphasis on understanding their historical and civilizational origins, rather than jumping on judgment and condemnation. And he did so without the cathartic expectation that over time, China would converge with Western conceptions of what we now would call freedom, democracy, human rights, and the rule of law. In the eyes of uh, many, this, is a, uh, this form of liberalism uh, is a contradiction. Uh, but in Fairbank, and I will suggest in several of his colleagues, that that form uh, of, uh, uh, of liberalism, that view of, of an element of relativism and tolerance is built into the Fairbank DNA. The flip side for Fairbank in the 1950s was managing his values and feelings about his own country. Throughout his life, he was a consistent critic of American exceptionalism and the exportability of the American dream. He did not accept the premise that the US had the mandate or capacity to save China or change China. In the late 1940s and 1950s, as anti-communism pervaded America, he commented that America was more threatened by homegrown fascism than Soviet or Chinese communism abroad. During the darkest days of his own battle with congressional committees and the loyalty debates, he would share privately his fears about America's future in his correspondence and private conversations but kept 
largely silent about them, managing his own feelings, uh, managing his own values in public statements and writings. Shortly before Rod McFarquhar, Fairbanks colleague uh, at Harvard, shortly before Rod's death in 2018, he summarized to me Fairbanks' position on managing his values as a practiced form of detachment, which he himself practiced. Fairbank and McFarquhar were not alone in their aspiration to this detachment. It came to be shared by many of their colleagues and students. And it was an awkward position, criticized in the 1950s by Fairbank's conservative critics, uh, saying that he underplayed the horrors of communist totalitarianism. It resurfaced uh, many times later, uh, some of them uh, from his students who were uh, perplexed by his views on the war in Vietnam and uh, uh, in that era before uh, he, he turned against that war. It surfaced later again when some of his best and most serious colleagues and uh, younger colleagues and students responded to what they saw as Fairbanks' calloused response to the events in Tiananmen Square that Fairbank presented as a predictable authoritarian reflex. The absence of the uh, condemnation, the absence of the um, sharp emotional expression was to them uh, wrong headed. It also arose in critical commentary on focused on other American liberals, uh, including Ezra Vogel. Uh, I know how much uh, Ezra was concerned by criticisms of him by other American liberals uh, who shared many of his views on other matters, but by other American liberals who felt that the biography of Deng Xiaoping, especially the descriptive rather than judgmental account of Deng's role during the Tiananmen events, that, that Ezra's biography was a moral betrayal of the cause of Chinese people. The third point, uh, third section is on the logic of engagement. In the period immediately after the outbreak of the Korean War, there was no viable option to containment and severe restrictions on Sino-American interactions imposed by both sides. Fairbank's own contacts with friends and colleagues in China, like Chen Tuancheng, were broken for more than a decade uh, as uh, uh, an iron curtain fell between American and China Chinese scholarship. By the mid 1950s, however, Fairbank was making the case for containment without isolation. And by the end of the decade, contact and competition, not containment. Phrases that curiously would not sound out of place if uh, another Harvard professor said the same thing in tomorrow's edition of the New York Times. Fairbank emphasized that self-strengthening was more important in competing with China than shutting it out. The word engagement was not yet in use, but he was advocating the normalization of diplomatic relations and doing whatever was possible when it was possible <clears throat> to establish connections with China and deepen the linkages with those scholars who studied China anywhere in the world. Talking about China, studying China, uh, was the prelude to working with China. As diplomatic relations thawed in the, in the late 1960s and early 1970s, Fairbank, Bob Scalapino, Doak Barnett and others provided the internet intellectual rationale and leadership for opening doors step by step, uh, including in the academic realm, first through study missions and exchanges and later through student flows. It took the American government most of the 1970s to embrace this broad conception of engagement. It had already found a home in Canada where there are very strong commonalities in outlook between Fairbank 
and a Canadian intellectual politician named Pierre Trudeau, who uh, led the way in establishing uh, diplomatic relations between Canada and the People's Republic in 1970 and bringing the PRC into the UN later. Those, those intellectual connections are a story for another occasion. Well, let me, let me come to the Biden moment. Uh, and if we imagined that John Fairbanks was alive, uh, or at least his ghost was with us, uh, how would he be reacting to the contemporary challenges in US-China relations? Well, one thing is very clear is that the, the approach of the Trump administration to China ran counter to almost every Fairbank fiber. Its binaries, the, uh, and as best often represented in the speeches by Secretary of State Pompeo, in those speeches, the binaries of good and evil, a Manichaean ideological conflict between authoritarian and democratic systems, fulsome exceptionalism, the complete vilification of the Chinese Communist Party, the advocacy of regime change, and the shutting of doors were antithesis to Fairbanks' views. I imagine he would have almost certainly supported the 3rd of July 2019 uh, opinion editorial in the Washington Post, signed by Ezra Vogel and a hundred others. Uh, that, that, um, that opinion editorial was a reminder that there is not a complete consensus in the United States. And it took some courage and moxie for those people, the, the, the group of 100 plus, to put out a view contrary to the prevailing opinion and the orthodoxy in Washington. That op-ed offered several propositions running against that confrontation consensus in Washington. Among them, that China is not fundamentally an enemy or existential threat to the United States, uh, that its behavior was uh, uh, dangerous and needed to be responded to, but that it was not uh, a fundamental threat, that engagement has been successful, and that decoupling would be costly and counterproductive, including in the realm of universities and intellectual and scientific exchange. Well, what might that ghost of Fairbank say as a Biden administration conducts its China policy review? While it remains to be seen what extreme competition with China might look like, it is being formulated by a highly experienced and skilled set of advisors, many of them with extensive experience in dealing with China and sometimes in China. So what would Fairbank say? Well, I think the first thing might be hire more Harvard educated people with a deep knowledge of history and China. Uh, it's fascinating how the sociology of knowledge has shifted in where people are trained, uh, the backgrounds they come out of. Washington's policy circles are not dominated by academics, but rather by people from think tanks, and only a few of the people in those think tanks come out of the, uh, 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 the Harvard scene in Fairbanks' ancestry. But I think uh, we were, we're puzzling through who might be the embodiment of someone who, while not a student at Harvard or uh, Fairbanks, but who is quite popular at Harvard and has been based there mainly at the uh, Harvard Kennedy School. That person is Kevin Rudd. And I raise uh, uh, Kevin Rudd's names because it's hard not to see a Fairbank agreeing with many of the viewpoints in, uh, in Rudd's analysis, his recommendations, uh, and uh, the, the kind of sensibilities that he brings into uh, analyzing uh, Chinese thought, action, and appropriate responses. Uh, there might be one caveat, and perhaps no one can explore this better than my co the commentator who we'll hear from very shortly. There's one caveat. 
Kevin Rudd, Australian, uh, uh, educated at the Australian National University, was introduced to Chinese history through the lens of sinology, not the kind of history that John Fairbank uh, and his, uh, his colleagues taught. Uh, Rudd was taught by Pierre Rickmans, also and probably better known by his pen name, Simon Lee. Uh, and it was reinforced through uh, Mr. Rudd's interaction with uh, his friend uh, and contemporary, Jeremy Barmé. Fairbank and Rickmans were not on the same page. Rickmans did a scathing critique of Fairbank in a book called Chinese Shadows uh, that uh, essentially uh, saw in him uh, hypocrisy and an individual who was uh, whitewashing or overlooking the fundamental evils of the uh, Chinese communist system. But as a historian, what the argument was about was a, a, a fundamental matter. In the flow of Chinese history, is the Chinese Communist Party a departure from it, a deviation, or in fact, is it the continuation of elements of an authoritarian tradition? And where Kevin Rudd stands on this matter does have something to do with what he thinks is possible about distinguishing the Chinese people from the Chinese Communist Party. And where, where Kevin Rudd stands on these matters, you can explore with him uh, next week when he gives the Gokeng Sui lecture uh, also at NUS. I think the second message uh, from uh, Fairbank, the ghost, would be don't close academic doors. Value, maintain student flows, exchanges, and collaborations. Reopen programs like the Fullback program in China, even with some of the risks inherent uh, in, uh, uh, in those exchanges that on balance, uh, the, uh, the, the weight is on their value to long-term defense of American interests and to uh, uh, finding a way to uh, work with China. Uh, <clears throat> and I think there's one other element which comes to mind as I know there are some of, some of the people listening today who are at Harvard. I think that a Fairbankian view is that defend as the facts warrant those professors, including at Harvard and MIT, who face public censure and prosecution for their involvement in research collaborations with Chinese counterparts. There are things that need to be tightened up. There are uh, new restrictions, but the, the almost demonization of a category of American scholars most of them of Chinese descent, uh, is something that Fairbank would no doubt see the resonance uh, to something in the 1950s aimed at a slightly different cast of scholars. And finally, look to history from a Chinese rather than a Western vantage point. And this is something that I've enjoyed very much in my visits to uh, Harvard over the last three years the discussions with Graham Allison and a group of concerned Harvard professors who see real dangers in the US-China relationship. Uh, and uh, Graham Allison's now famous Thucydides trap says that in an era of power transition, there are big dangers. If the Peloponnesian Wars were caused by the rise of Athenian power and the fear that this caused in Sparta, is there not a strong likelihood that the rise of Chinese power and the fear it is generating in the US will lead to a similar disastrous outcome. Uh, Fairbank would share the premise of the question uh, that a major conflict between the US and China is entirely possible. Uh, Fairbank was far from sanguine that conflict rooted in cultural differences and American desire for remaining supremacy could be avoided. But perhaps, he would suggest as Graham Allison and Ezra Vogel before his death and some others at Harvard were suggesting that try looking at the relationship 
not through the lens of Xi Jinping himself, but through the broader Chinese historical experience that might produce a better solution. Uh, and an idea that uh, Professor Allison and some of his colleagues found quite intriguing was that rather than seeing China as the binary understood in Western diplomacy as friend or adversary, competitor or cooperator, what about seeing it in a blended way as what they describe as a partner rival? And <clears throat> it was fascinating to watch discussions and debates about reinvestigating the Chanyuan Treaty between the Northern Song and the Liao dynasties in the year 10,004 that ended a long period of fighting and in, ushered in a century of peace in which there were two sons of heaven sort of recognized by each other. Well, this is, I, I, I don't mean to be trivial because you can cherry pick from Chinese history just about anything you want to find. But the effort to look at China from the inside out, to look at its experience, that is the phrase there, and that is the Fairbank trademark. So in conclusion, where does this leave us? How can uh, a look at a preeminent historian in a period 70 years ago shed some light and give some optimism in a period of dark clouds over the US-China relationship? Fundamentally, Fairbank believed that the mighty edifice of monographs and knowledge produced by serious scholars at Harvard and elsewhere would be a partial antidote to the antagonism and fear that surfaced in the 1950s and returned 50 years later. For those of us who believe in the curative properties of scholarship, good history in particular, he leaves us with a conundrum. Despite that magnificent accumulation of knowledge about China and the thousands of academics who produce it, um, the American approach to China today often seems as culture bound as it was when Fairbank's career began. And it may be distant to destined to, replace, to repeat the same mistakes. The challenge that Fairbank posited in the conclusion to the second edition of the United States in China in 1958 couldn't be more prescient. Writing then, Fairbank said, the century during which the Chinese had to learn to live in the Western world is past. Now we have both to learn to live on the same planet. What a challenge for the Biden administration and all of us. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Professor Evans. This was a wonderful, wonderful speech. And, and I have to say, when you talked about Fairbank in the 50s, I remember starting in the China program of the World Bank in the early 90s, and that was still in the aftermath of China then. And all of my friends said, well, why would you want to work for a country like that who did China men? And I see some people in the audience, including Professor Peter Bottelier and, and Nick Hope, who had to deal with the same, with the same dilemma. Uh, we have a wonderful audience, uh, who, and I'm sure uh, you're all keen to, to submit questions. Please do. There's even some Harvard professors that have uh, that are in the audience. Michael Zoni, of course, uh, the the head, the director of the Fairbank Center, is also in the audience. I'm very very uh, uh, honored with the presence, and I apologize for the. A very imperfect interaction through a Q&A box, but I do look forward to your questions. But before that, we turn to Professor Wang Gungwu for his comments on Professor Evans' wonderful speech. Professor, Professor Wang. Thank you very much. I, let me say straight away that I'm very grateful to Paul Evans for reminding me of the fact that when his first, his book, first study of Fairbank came out in 1988, I enjoyed it tremendously and read it as history. That, that was a period gone by. So I was very struck by his uh, determination to show the relationship of this, those very troublesome years of the 1950s, how they might help us think about the present. And that, that's something that I did not, did not uh, think, of, think about before. So I'm very grateful for the way he has very sh sharply and pointedly raise questions which were very much in the minds of people in the 1950s when the United States 
for the first time, looked at China as an enemy, as a, at least a potential enemy. Uh, so I, I've been, you know, led to rethink the 1950s for myself. And what you have said strikes me as drawing upon, upon your knowledge much more than I have about what happened then, that there is a lot there for us to think about. But what, for, what struck me for the, first, for the first point you made was that uh, you, you talked about the darkest days of the 1950s as a time when the Americans feared the rise of China or the China as a communist state. Uh, and of course, part of the larger Cold War, Soviet Union, partner of the Soviet Union and following the Korean War. Certainly there was that, but I felt that there was some one big difference which might be important for us today. And that is that uh, it was not really fear of China so much as communism as a larger anti-capitalist ideology determined to destroy capitalism on the one hand and the rise of Soviet Union as a very powerful force compared to which actually China was a very weak and divide and still relatively divided and, uh, and uh, economically uh, very highly, highly undeveloped. So given those conditions, I thought what was happening in the 1950s was less fear of China as anger within the United States about the idea of who lost China. At least that's what my reading was. And the idea of who lost China was that China was meant to be a partner in the whole war against communism. It, and after all, the Pacific War was to save China from both fascism and communism. And that they had almost succeeded when somehow the whole thing collapsed and Chiang Kai-shek's nationalist government failed. And the thought was that the American experts of the time had failed to understand that and somehow lost, lost, the, lost sight of the main issue and therefore lost China. And there was anger from within, which led to both the McCarran com com Committee and of course uh, McCarthy and the, the kind of determination to sort of sort out and pick out all those people who were to blame for this great loss. So the anger from within the United States was probably greater than fear of, actual fear of China itself. Certainly fear of the, of the global communist uh, threat and the spread of communism through, throughout the developed world, a developing world. I think that part was true. But that anger part is something I think might be something we might look at today. And that is when you look at the, the present, my feeling is that there's actually genuine fear today. And the fear is not much more, much more reasonable. It's, it's justified fear that China is not weak, no longer economically depressed, but some actual economic superpower ready to challenge the United States. And of course, in other ways, still very backward compared to the United States, but that economic potential that China still has is something that is something to be afraid of. And behind it all, what does China want? All these become questions asked of the, th the nature of that threat or the long-term effect of that threat. So the fear, I think, is something stronger today than it, it was before. It's not so much anger within, it is actually fear of the loss of the American position in the world because China is going to try to replace it in one way or the other, at least in the region of Eurasia, if not across the whole world. So I think that element of fear is more genuine today and that troubles me much more than anything else. Secondly, I think the other thing is how to manage this. Uh, the idea of engagement that uh, Fairbank stood for, I share very much. I still share that. I mean, I, I do remember one occasion. In fact, the only occasion when Fabian and I appeared on the same stage was at a AAS meeting in, in Michigan, where we were actually uh, put on the stage to discuss the question, just in 1967, whether or not to recognize the People's Republic of China. A very controversial subject at the time, but already after the after the way the Vietnam War was going, I think gaining traction almost everywhere. And so Fairbank invited a few people to join him on the stage to, to discuss this. And I remember, I, I certainly shared his views, and far, far from being uh, a rare view, 
almost everybody in the audience were in general in sympathy with the view. So I was not, a, not at all in front of a hostile audience, but actually a very sympathetic audience. But nevertheless, there were hostile voices challenging us for, for, for saying what we did, that it was time to recognize the legitimacy and the sovereignty of this new country. How can we keep, keeping, keep China out of the United Nations, for example? You simply indefensible, indefensible. So this was the time when I was shared with him and then we had some conversation together. So I do totally understand that difficult position of being the engaged academic and publicly engaged in the way which I was not. I was simply drawn in to discuss something in the academic atmosphere, but he was actually publicly out there standing for the, 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 the time. It was time to recognize China and establish normal relations with China. So I, I do sense that the problem, the dilemma of being the academic that needs to try and convey what he knows to the public that may not be ready for it. But this leads me to another point, which is also, I think, relevant to you, what you were raising about the role of Harvard training or the top academics at the time being drawn into public service one way or the other. I'm struck by the fact that when I went to the United States in the 19, in 1960, the 1950s to me had been a period when the academics were very much engaged. But the, the, the two academics that caught my attention at the time were, in fact, one was someone called William Griffiths, who wrote a book called The Sino-Soviet Conflict. And uh, it was well received in academic circles, but a lot of people like other very strong academics like Brzezinski actually opposed it saying that there's no genuine conflict. These people are communists. They'll always work together against America's interests and so on. And Brzezinski ought to know because he came from Central Europe and he was very much involved in the understanding of what the Soviet Union was about. But what struck me at the time was that there were two academics coming from the same background, studying the same area, because Griffiths was also a specialist in Soviet affairs, coming to the completely opposite conclusions it turned out that Griffith was right. There was a split and that split which he foresaw became fully under clear by the time Kissinger came on the scene. Now that to me is very striking for another reason. And that when they raised their voices about this so Sino-Soviet split and what the United States, United States can do about it to, in, to build on it, to encourage it, take advantage of it and probably help to draw China away from the Soviet Union. This, the beginnings of that idea, I think, came from that particular debate in which Kissinger joined in and later on, became, when he became advisor to, to Nixon, was able to put in place. But of course, it took a little while. But nevertheless, it struck me, another thing struck me was the fact that in all three cases, the, the, their thoughts about China did come out in their, in their writings, but it came out of their expertise on Central and, U and Eastern Europe. Yes. None of them had any knowledge of China per se. In fact, they didn't pay much attention to China. I mean, Kissinger, we know, expert on Euro Europe, on the Congress of Vienna. Brzezinski was very much about Eastern Europe, Central and Eastern Europe. And Will William Griffiths very, very actively involved in those denazification programs at a time in, in Europe. And they were the ones who raised this question and they were listened to. Their voice carried without any Chinese expertise because the whole establishment was very much feared towards the Soviet Union and the Cold War was, was there. over there. The Far East really was not that particularly relevant. This was where the, the war was really about and what to, what to do to undermine Soviet influence, to reduce Soviet power and influence in the, in the rest of the world was a major goal to achieve, achieve. That is the main goal. And so what struck me was that turn around to look at China diff with different eyes really came from the perspective of how to deal with Soviet Union. That was how it was looked at. Now that is different from today. In fact, today what we are facing and what is so puzzling and difficult to, to gauge is that today we have lots of Chinese expertise and the lots of Chinese expertise are actually some of them are actually in the government giving tremendous good advice and sound advice in some ways and other ways very uh, very judgmental advice to the government 
to the State Department, to the Pentagon and so on. And these are experts, including those produced by Harvard, incidentally. And, and they, are, they are giving advice in which says that, look out for China. They are a genuine threat. We have reason to fear that they have uh, um, uh, objectives which will, be, which will undermine our national interest. And America has reason to worry about it. And we must do something about it to contain China, to make sure that China should, should, should fail in, this, in their particular enterprise. So we have a different situation. And so those Harvard people now and others who do not share this view about containing and isolating China are having a much harder time than Fairbank had because they are facing with a group of other Sinologists and China experts who are giving the opposite advice. So I think this is what is different about it today. And why I think giving it, what Fairbank has to say to Biden has to be taken in a different context. And I'm not sure that Fairbank anticipated this. I'm not sure that he would. I think he thought that was over. I mean, the time of engagement had, had begun before he died and he could see that other possibilities were there. Even though he, he knew straight away, or even then, that there's no question of convergence. There's no question of China becoming like the United States. He had all those uh, reservations about the policy of the time, but he would not have anticipated the time when America would fear China in a way rather comparable to the way he feared the Soviet Union in the 1950s. And whether or not today's policy is try to woo the Soviet Union, or try to fool Russia away to, 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 to use Russia as a means of containing China, I do not know whether these are parallels to be, to be followed or not, but I, can, I, I think it is worthwhile to think, who are the experts today who are giving advice to, to Washington as compared to those, those in the 1950s and 60s? And I think this is of some interest. And another thought was that I felt that right at the beginning, Fairbank had some understanding of something which is very difficult for the West to understand. And that is the idea of a party state. Uh, I, I don't mean a one party state, I mean party state. There's no one party or two parties, there's only party. And that a party is equivalent to, and in that sense, the superior ruler, emperor, recognizable by all Chinese as an emperor far away, but now not so far away, but nevertheless representing something that is over and above all the people. And there's no question of an opposition party, no question of the idea of political participation of the people directly and openly against the ruler. And once you see it that way, that the communist party is equivalent to an emperor in the, in the eyes of the Chinese people, people in a party state. Now, I don't know whether Fairbank actually said that or not or recognized that or not, but if he, if he did, I think it will fit in with his idea <clears throat> that this authoritarian heritage that the Chinese people have had is, is a civilizational difference. It is a difference of political culture, which is very deep and have certain very deep roots in, the, in Chinese history is something that you cannot wish away, wish away. And that is the reason why you are right to say, and that Fairbank understood that the question of convergence with the liberal uh, United States seems to be almost impossible. And that, that, is, that is, I think, his genuine con conclusion. And I think there's a reason for that. Once you know that this is a party state, which has its roots in a kind of bureaucratic, meritocratic, meritocratic a bureaucracy sent highly centralized with, with tremendous reverence to the idea of centralized power. All that, if that is part of the heritage that is looked at again with positive hope and belief that this actually suits China better than the liberal alternative, then the, the position becomes a totally different kind of, 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 uh, of, of contention. So I would end with simply one, one last note that in this context, the idea that we are not fighting over ideology now, we are fighting over systems, a liberal system compared to an authoritarian system. You may want to make it in an, into an ideological difference, but it's fundamentally two governance systems that are now using the modern science and technology, finance, economics, and the global free market economy under WTO rules and so on and so forth to actually develop capitalism in many directions. And this, of course, is a major challenge. It's a new challenge. And I think this, if you 
describe the challenge in those terms rather than say communism is evil and we are good and, and, and diabolically demonize uh, the, the Chinese thing. That way, it seemed to me, is in the 1950s. I'm not sure that today you can use those, those images in the context where I think more and more people are recognizing that this so-called state capitalism that socialism with Chinese characteristics is turning out to be is, is offering a different kind of challenge that needs a different kind of response. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Wang. And I'm going to ask Paul to do the impossible. Uh, I, this was a, a, a speech worthy by itself, but maybe a few reactions from you, Paul, but short. I know there will be other occasions where you can exchange further with Professor Wang, uh, but there's also some wonderful questions waiting in the box that I would really also want to pay attention to. And we have limited time left. Please, Paul. Two, two very small points in response to some remarkable observations. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> the first is the blend of fear and anger uh, in the 1950s as compared to now. And my guess is that a Fairbank would pick up immediately that what you call the anger of the loss of China, the anger that China didn't go down the path that uh, that, that many Americans had hoped, uh, that, that's true. Uh, <clears throat> but that now in, uh, he would see then uh, a comparison to what is happening now. Many of those Americans who are fearful of China now are also angry with China as a sense of kind of, uh, uh, how does one frame it? Uh, uh, as a sense of betrayal that China's opening that they had expected would produce a path towards convergence of economies and of maybe those systems to some point. The blend is, is, is I still think, a blend rather than one or the other. Uh, <clears throat> Gongwu, the second point, and I'll just leave it uh, as a question for you. If those Harvard-trained people who are in Washington and are some of the hawkish, uh, almost non-Fairbankian uh, uh, mindsets. How can Harvard bring them back for thought reform? Uh, how can historians uh, bring uh, the diversity of views and the sophistication of them on China is highly diverse. Uh, Harvard people aren't of a single mind, but who, who might be one of those Fairbankians in 21st century clothing? And do you agree that one of them might be a Kevin Rudd? I think I'm going to question answer that questions. question now. I think that the other questions to come. But right. I think you better give a chance to the others. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, as that, we can judge after next week's presentation, a uh, speech by Kevin Rudd himself. Um, <laughs> I'm going to start the questions, and, and the first one I'll read out completely. It comes from Michael Zoni, who uh, uh, already submitted before I provoked him asking a question, but it's a wonderful question, and I read it out completely. Thank you for your splendid, thought-provoking lecture, which also gives me much to reflect on in my own professional role. You mentioned three men who led the Center for East Asia Research and the Fairbank Center. Fairbank himself, Rodman Farquhar, and Ezra Vogel. Can you say more about the differences in how these three men approached the three broad topics you addressed in your lecture. Is there a historical arc that takes from Fairbanks through Fogel to McFarquhar uh, and the early 21st century? Or is the story about it just one of diverse personalities dealing with the complex and challenging relationship in their own way? I know this is a, an outline for a book, but it's a fantastic question. And I hope that you have some reaction to this, Paul. Uh, the first reaction, uh, Michael, is I, I hope you will write that story as the uh, sixth generation emperor of the, uh, of the Fairbank Center. Be interesting to see your thoughts. Uh, as I look through the papers of um, Fairbank in his time, uh, of Ezra's time, and, and some of the, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, uh, some of the McFarquhar time, uh, I, I would say 75% convergence in outlook uh, in um, a, that commitment to openness. 
you know, one of the issues that have been debated for many years is whether there's a Harvard school. Uh, Paul Cohen speaks about it. I, I'm not so sure there is, but I think there is a Harvard ethos that Fairbank embodied and helped establish. And as I mentioned, uh, the interaction with what Rod saw as Fairbank's general approach, they didn't all agree on specifics. Uh, they didn't agree on the nature of the Chinese party. It was an intensely interesting debate. But in general terms, their positing of a uh, need for broad-based interactions with Chinese counterparts, their believer that scholarly exchange could and should be defended uh, in the face of some who, who weren't so keen on it. Uh, I hope that, I don't know we're going to get a McFarquhar biography uh, in the near future, though it's, it's possible and I hope for it. The one we're, we're hoping for is, is Ezra's, uh, Ezra Vogel's, that Ezra was very keen in his admiration for Fairbank, but also his distancing from Fairbank. There were some historical differences uh, about elements of Chinese history, but there was a difference in attitude about how you believe and treat people. And the management of, a, of an institute depends in part on the style of what you expect. Uh, some were quite critical of Fairbank as basically believing that the game was in producing the most number of manuscripts possible, building that edifice, not as a nasty person, but single-mindedly. And uh, I think that both of the other two uh, took a little bit different approach to how you manage human relations in an institute. But uh, Professor Zanyi, it's up to you as a Canadian uh, to write the outside story on this matter. When Fairbank let me into his papers for a decade, he once told me, he said, I'll, I'll let you do it. There were other people who wanted to, but I, I, I saw you and after an hour, he made the decision. He said, because uh, you are not one of my students, uh, because you're not part of the CCAS generation, and because you're not an American, uh, that you can see some of these things with a distance. Uh, Harvard is cosmopolitan but Harvard is American. And you, Professor Zandi, by asking that question, have just set up a great essay. All right. Um, it gives me hope as a Dutchman to also have a, a, a non-Harvard a non career in Chinese uh, studies. Um, uh, a question from my colleague, Dr. Lance Gore, that I think is very interesting. On the US part, the notion that communism is evil and its rise is a threat. And on the Chinese side, the West, especially the US, is out to get there. Those are opinions deeply held by the population. And, and I heard Professor Wang's doubt on the evil notion of communism, but I think um, among, among ordinary people, that is still very much a, 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 a term to deal with. Now, how can one resolve those very deep divisions? And then how to go beyond the intellectuals? Uh, uh, intellectual exchange, university exchange, university professors in a room, I'm sure they can be all civil and exchange, but how, how can one go broader and, and change broader mindsets in both countries? What an interesting problem. Uh, and it's, <clears throat> it's a dilemma. Fairbank's answer was you hit on all fronts uh, as a scholar, as an expert, and as a, as a pundit, uh, give a thousand speeches uh, try to, to use media, et cetera. But um, I think the first thing that Fairbank's lesson would be is when you find people who can speak across those differences, um, you hold them close to your bosom. Uh, you bring them, you, you spend time, you invest in them in their careers. That not everyone can do this, but there are some very special people. And I think that was the same view that Ezra Vogel had as well, that there are special Japanese, special Chinese, special Americans who can do it. How to get it to the mainstream is, is a very difficult problem. Uh, one of the approaches that is being tried, and Harvard colleagues speak to it, is about programs for getting young scholars to be more involved in policy discussions. And there's, 
there's a practical wisdom in that. Uh, they might be able to have an impact. Young generation communicate in ways that Fairbank couldn't even have imagined. But Fairbank also had a warning about what that can do to them as scholars. The points I was making about premature publication, premature jumping into the policy realm. It's a very important strategic question of whether Fairbank suspicions based on his experience are what we should have now too. Or is the way, one of the best things we can do is send forth our students, send forth our, our, our young people to engage those discussions. As for broader images in the broader public, my heavens, what a difficult time. What a difficult time when, <clears throat> as, as Professor Wong mentioned, it's often our media and our journalists who have some of the hardest views of China. Uh, there's always been an element of that. But <clears throat> in this generation, it's very difficult to find a journalist uh, who has had deep experience in China, who comes back with that detachment uh, Maybe a few, Peter Hessler and some others, but uh, it's, it's a, probably a minority position now. To know China, to get into it, is to, is to be angry and fearful of it. Holtinger was the name that came to my mind on the journalist side. Um, combination of uh, Colonel Harold Kabunok's question for, from the Philippines and my colleague Lampeng R. Uh, because it is about history, but it's also very much about current affairs, and that is the South China <coughs> How How would a Fairbanks, or for, how would your interpretation, the ghost of Fairbanks, approach such a difficult, intricate question that has deep historical roots? Uh, I, I'm sorry, what was the historical the South, question? The South, the South China Sea, on the South China Sea, the conflict, the potential conflict and the, the claims in the South China Sea. Um, to the best of my knowledge, uh, I never saw Fairbank make a comment on the South China Sea. He had many, many years of commentary on the Taiwan question. Uh, <clears throat> and there, there was a pretty complex set of evolving views on how to deal with it. But I would, I would think that uh, a Fairbankian answer to that would be to read Wang Gungwu's writings on this matter. And I say that with complete sincerity, is that the understanding of China's maritime frontiers, uh, the understanding of, uh, Fa Fairbank was dead before the South China Sea became the kind of issue that it is now. But in its conception, its defensiveness, uh, Fairbank's basic view that China is not expansionist. Uh, it pushes around the edges, but he doesn't see it. He didn't see it as expansionist in the same way as the United States and other countries of the 20th century. <clears throat> so to unwind it, you look at what Chinese views are of what they think the problem is. Uh, and as I say, that's where Professor Wong and a generation of historians need to tell that side of the story. Uh, not that it's going to necessarily convinces of its uh, current application, but make sure we see, um, uh, see this thing from the inside out and not just as a matter of abstract international law. Um, a question from Hu Chang Boon of RSIS. Um, and and he, he says, look, uh, the 50s may have been the darkest time, but the, the times of engagement, the, the highlights of engagement in the 70s and the 80s uh, was really also um, um, sparked by uh, a common threat in the Soviet Union. That's no longer there. And maybe what we see now, this, this tension between the two superpowers is a natural outcome of that. Uh, how, how would you react to that? How would you see that? And what, what can be the, I mean, what can be the common thread, not the threat, but the common thread that could that could uh, 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 bring the US and China together again. You know, this is very interesting um, how essentially the triangular relationship 
uh, of the United States, China, and the Soviet Union uh, produced the Nixon opening to China and the, the era of diplomatic engagement that, that, that followed. I think we're in, a, we're in an era beyond three poles. It's a multipolar world. There's a lot of players, but there are only two suns in the sky now. And that in that context, uh, what we saw as using other players to counterbalance, there'll be lots of that. Uh, the Europeans have a voice in these matters. Um, the Japanese, the Indians, but the fundamental distribution of power is bipolar and is becoming more so. Uh, and in that context, this is in structural terms, a new era, uh, bipolarity, but not tripolarity. Uh, and uh, that there is no third player that is equivalent uh, to, um, uh, to change the power dynamics. So it's a headlong competition between two countries, two systems, uh, as has been put forward. And <clears throat> uh, uh, some of my colleagues give me difficulty for this explanation because they say you're forgetting India. Uh, my sense is that India is not now and it's not in the foreseeable future going to be uh, 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 that third sun in the sky, uh, comparable to the dynamics between the United States and China. All right, I have one final question, which is an impossible question, but nevertheless an interesting question. Uh, what is your views on the longer telegram that was recently published? Uh, for those that are less historically inclined, it was the long telegram of Canon from Moscow explaining the Soviet threat, but there was more recently in Foreign Affairs, I believe, an article which is called the Longer Telegram. No, it's not Foreign Affairs. I, foreign Atlantic Policy. Council. Okay. It's, okay. Atlantic, Atlantic Council and Political. Uh, sorry. I'm sorry. The Longer Telegram, an anonymous Longer Telegram um, describing ways of, well, first describing uh, a, a, a China reality, I should say, and then second, a possible response of the United States? Um, I, I could only imagine a fair Bankian response, and I, I probably am putting my own reading into this. I think that the portrait of power and uh, uh, interests inside China in that long telegram was fantasy. Uh, it's an imaginary step. I think that the practical prescription that in essence, the problem lies with Xi Jinping uh, and that there should be ways that the United States can uh, try to uh, either limit or reduce or eventually eliminate uh, Xi Jinping's side is yet another fantasy. I see the long telegram uh, as in some ways an attempt to use an analysis of the Soviet Union, applying it to China. And I think that uh, uh, I was going to say Fairbank would turn in his grave at the, at the analysis and the prescriptions. But the point is Fairbank doesn't have a grave. Uh, he uh, decided that um, uh, I once asked him what word he would like put on his tombstone. And he said, uh, first, I'm not going to have a tombstone. But if I did, it would have one word on it educator. Uh, and instead of having that tombstone or even a headstone, his uh, ashes were scattered over the garden at the back of his Franklin, New Hampshire home. Uh, but those ashes would be turning in their grave at the logic of that telegram. Uh, and uh, we, uh, uh, I'm sorry, we didn't have a chance for Ezra, uh, Vogel, or Rod uh, uh, more recently, uh, to, to be able to respond to it as well. But I think it's a, my personal view is it's a recipe for a kind of hawkish containment that uh, is going to bring that conflict closer rather than push it back. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for this insight.
and and helpful guidance on this on this piece, which is making waves. But uh, more so, thank you so much for your wonderful speech and answers to the many many interesting questions, Professor Wang. Thank you so much for your comments. And again, uh, it, it is a speech by itself. And I think, I, Paul, you really have to come back to the East Asian Institute to spend more time with us and discuss these matters further as soon as we overcome COVID. Thanks everybody in the audience. We've had a wonderful audience and I know I shortchanged the question simply because we ran out of time. Uh, uh, we did capture all the questions and Paul will hopefully have a further look at, at some of them and come back to you personally. Uh, but I thought this was a wonderful experience. I learned a lot and I hope you did so too. Next week, I said I'll make a separate announcement uh, on that, and you can already find it on our website. Uh, uh, Mr. Kevin Rudd uh, speaking on US-China relationship and the implications for the rest of Asia with the emphasis on the latter. Thank you all very, very much. Thank you. Thank you.